This video includes material of an adult's nature. There'll be a heck of a lot of swearing, and we'll be drinking a heck of a lot of alcohol. That means if you're a child, get on Go on, go to bed, go! Viewer discretion is advised. Fang. It's smoky, spicy, tart. It's all the right notes. Especially to drink with a good vampire movie. Especially a good Dracula movie. Especially 1931's universal classic Dracula with Bela Lugosi. My name is Catherine. Welcome to Morbid Mixology. Today I'm going to teach you how to make the Fang. You'll want one, believe me. I'm going to talk a little bit about the inspiration behind the Fang that 1931 Dracula movie. And, you know, there are tons of Dracula movies out there, right? Just tons of versions. You know, you've got Gary Oldman's version, you know, Lisa Frank's, Bram Stoker's Dracula. You've got uh, the Frank Langella version. But honestly, the best, my favorite, is the 1931 Bela Lugosi film. And I know that you are a well-read and well-traveled group, so you know that movie. You've seen it, right? I'm sure you have. Um, but I'm sure you don't know some of the story behind the movie. Someone who had much more to do with the creation of that film than you might think. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And I'm going to sip on this lovely drink. Mm -mm -mm. So, Bram Stoker. He wrote Dracula in 1897. And at the time, he was the manager of the Lyceum Theater. And authoring was kind of his second gig. He was highly prolific, but I wouldn't say entirely successful. I think today, Dracula is about the only thing anybody could name that he's written, to be honest with you. So, being in the theater as he was, he was super excited about his book, but he wanted a theatrical element to it. So he decided, hey, I'm going to do a reading of the entire book at the Lyceum Theater. So he did. He invited a lot of people, and it was apparently atrocious. A good time was not had by all. Now, if you've ever read the book, you can maybe kind of understand that. Um, it's an example of an epistolary novel, which is your vocab word for the day. Uh, it means it's all written in journals and letters and recollections, which sounds like an interesting way to do a book, but on paper it actually wasn't. So don't do that. The book sold pretty well. Never a bestseller per se, but it sold steadily. So, you know. When he passed away in 1912, though, he left his family with not a whole lot of money. And that's where we're going to introduce you to Florence Stoker, his wife. She is a force of nature and she needs to be talked about. So Florence Stoker, 1912, her husband has passed away. She doesn't have a lot of money. You know, she needs to be kept in jewels and gin. So she wants to think about like, how am I going to make an income now? What do I have? Well, I have this Dracula. It's a property that sells okay. Um, I think it would be great in the cinema. So I'm going to work to get a film made of Dracula. Now in 1922, she gets a very difficult surprise. <laughs> she discovers that there is a German film group that actually has made the movie already. Now, they're being clever about it. They're not calling it Dracula, and none of the characters are named Dracula, but goddammit, it is fucking Dracula, okay? They are copying off her paper. Which is not cool, by the way. Don't do that. And so she's not getting a goddamn dime from this, right? And so she's like, well, fuck this shit. I am going to take them to court. So, when you're dealing with a blood sucker, what do you do but hire more blood suckers? She gets her own lawyers to go after this company so to sue the pants off of them. Well, unfortunately, the film company, they had lost all of their pants through bankruptcy, and so there was no money for her to get, which was really a bum rap for her. But once she won the court case, the court decided that she could actually have all the prints of the film destroyed. Now, this sounds like a good outcome. Life is good. However, they weren't really paying attention to the destruction of the prints, and so a few escaped. So a couple of years later, it turns up in New York. It shows up in a London film club. And poor fucking Florence. She's got to deal with this shit all over. Well, this isn't the end of it, of course. She is much more uh, steadfast in her pursuit of this money. So she is going to then 
deal with a couple of playwrights and create a successful stage play for Dracula. She figures if it's a successful stage play, maybe that's a good platform to make it to cinema. So she works with a couple of playwrights, um, Halderson and Dean, and they create something that becomes very popular. And one of the reasons it becomes so popular is that they actually make some pretty good changes from the book. So if you read the original novel, Dracula, he's not an attractive person. You know, he's a bit of a monster. You'd probably tase his ass if he approached you at a bar. Not cool at all. Not at all what we think of vampires really now. So they decided to sex him up a bit. You know, they're going to put him in the formal outfit. They're going to give him a cape because capes are iconic. You got to have a cape. Uh, they're going to slick back his hair, give him a bit of a foreign accent, you know, because women love accents, give him a touch of mystery. Um, and then now you have your template for the Dracula as we know him. So this was a popular stage play in the United States and it traveled all over. Started in New York on Broadway and actually made its way out to Los Angeles when Universal was actually casting its Dracula movie. So Florence was finally going to get her payday. Interestingly enough, while it's in Los Angeles, the person who was playing Dracula at the time, Bela Lugosi, he actually decides that he is going to go lobby Universal for the role. And he lobbies hard. He has the outfit, he has the slick back hair, the sexy accent, he's an I'm your man. And he gets the job. Now, one of the reasons he got the job, I think, is because he was working cheap. He was only getting $500 a week for it, which is... Not that's nuts when you think about the job he did, um, but that's how the movie came about. Now I love this movie. I think it's it's the atmosphere of it is nightmarish, dreamlike. There's lots of shadows and angles. Bella is awesome at it, his role. I just love it. One of the best things about the film to me is actually something funny that happens towards the beginning of the film. Renfield goes to visit Dracula at his castle. And that's one of the big changes that the movie makes from the novel. Uh, it's not Jonathan Harker visiting uh, Dracula, it's actually Renfield. So Renfield is there, and he comes into the Count's house, and this place is a shithole. I mean, it is completely derelict. It looks like it hasn't been cleaned in years. It looks like my room when I was a teenager. Dracula needs Orkin, and he needs the Merry Maids, like, right away. Unfortunately, he'd probably eat the Merry Maid, so that's not going to happen. But anyway, this place is just awful. And you can see in the shadows, there's all this stuff scuttling around. There's all these um, rats and mice and spiders and shit. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes a group of armadillos. Now, I don't know if you know much about armadillos, but they are not native to Europe. They're actually native to the Americas, to Texas. So I don't know how he ended up with armadillos in his house. I don't know why Todd Browning thought that maybe armadillos were scary enough or exotic enough to include, but it's ridiculous. Honestly, there has to be somewhere a Dracula in Austin where he gets his Dracodillos. And if there isn't, I myself am going to write it because that is a hell of a story. So there you go. That's the 1931 Dracula film. Mm. So I think I've talked enough about the movie now and I need a bit of a refill. So let's go to the bar and learn how to make the Fang. All right, everyone, welcome to the bar. Yes, the bar where all the magic takes place and where I will teach you to make your very own Fang. Let's go over the ingredients. There's just a few of them, but there is a smidge of homework involved. So pay attention. There will be a quiz later. First of all, we have our pomegranate juice. This is what's going to give the Fang that amazing pinky red look. Um, yes, it is healthy, but don't worry, we will kill all that health with alcohol. So, hold on. Second thing we're going to use is tequila. And this is a Hornitos Reposado. And I love this because it is smoky, it's full flavored, absolutely delicious. Now, you can use silver, but honestly, that's for, you know, college freshmen who are drinking it out of a coffee cup for shot contests. Look, I did a lot of that. I won all of them. Use Reposado, you're an adult now. But we're not just using the Reposado, we're actually doing something a little different. Ta-da. No, I didn't pee in a jar, not Howard Hughes. But this is basically that Hornitos and it's been infused with half a jalapeno to give it that bite. Bite, fang, get it? Uh, this was left in the jar for 12 hours. Now I meant to leave it in for 10, but I had a happy hour and then I fell asleep. And then by the time I woke up and said, oh shit, the tequila, it was 12 hours later. 
as you do. So this is very spicy. So, you know, you do you, but um, I do recommend at least the 10 hours because it does have a very nice bite to it. Now our third and last ingredient, last but not least, this is triple sec. This gives it uh, a little bit of sweetness. There's a little bit of an orange flavor to it. Uh, it'll cut the tartness of the pomegranate as well. So let's go. First, we have in our shaker here, this is a Boston shaker and it is full of ice. Now I think this drink works better on the rocks as opposed to up. Um, if you do it otherwise, you're fine to do that, but you would be wrong, so don't. All right, now we're gonna put our ingredients in our mixer here. I'm gonna start with pomegranate. And we're gonna do one ounce of the pomegranate. So it'll be nice and sweet, but not overly so. There we go. Very nice. Now for our tequila, we're going to do two ounces of that. So yes, this drink is going to have a bit of a punch to it, but you know, we're all adults here. There we go. Oh, you can really smell it. <laughs> Very strong. I love it. All right, then third and last, but not least, our triple sec. We're only gonna do a half ounce of that so that we're not doing something that's overly sweet. <laughs> there we go. All right, so now comes the fun part, the shaking part. I'm going to take my shaker here, put this in there. Now, we're gonna make sure that this is nice and tight and secure so that when I'm shaking this, it doesn't go all over me and all over God's green earth. I also like to do a pop here to kind of just settle it down. So here we go, the shaking. There's nothing like the sound of a shaker, right? When it's full of ice and drink, I just love it. Whoop, whoop, whoop. I like to play. All right. Got our old fashioned glass here. Pour that in. My cup runneth over, but that'll do. All right, see, isn't that pretty? Don't you want one? I know you do. Now, that looks divine, but needs a little something. So, we're gonna do what any adult would do. And we are going to put uh, just a little topper on it, a little garnish, if you will. We're gonna use Haribo's Sour Vampire Bats. Haribo, kids and grown-ups love it so. I have a sustainable bamboo skewer. And what we're gonna do with that is we are going to kill us some vampire bats. A little batty here, see? Here we go. Ta-da, isn't he cute? Look at that, isn't that cute? Okay. All right, we'll put that in our drink and ta-da. It is the thing. Hope you enjoyed the recipe that I gave you this week. If you do try it out, please let me know. Put it out in the comments. Um, and I hope if you enjoyed being here that you will go ahead and subscribe to our channel. And for now, we'll say goodbye. Don't drink anything I wouldn't do. And cheers.